What should I talk about today? Maybe before I move on to middle school, I should talk a little bit more about elementary school. Hmm? Uh, our school district, elementary school, was kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade. That was elementary. Middle school, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade. And then high school was ninth grade through 12th grade. I don't know if now they've standardized that, that so that kindergarten through 6th is elementary and 7th through 9 is junior high and 10th through 12 is high school. I don't know if they've changed that here in the school district, but the way it was set up when I was in 4th grade, that was middle school. Middle school. So uh, I realized I... I should probably mention, uh, despite having these, these uh, symptoms, symptoms of anxiety and depression and hearing voices and having um, extreme moods, very intense emotions, uh, feeling sensitivity to stress, um, I wasn't always in the grip of my symptoms. I had some moments where I was free from them and I just got to feel like a kid and I, I was happy and I was uh, I would say in a way I was a cool person in my own way like in kindergarten I was so happy to finally be in school and go oh this is where my brothers have been going every day when they get on the bus this is where they go school I'm here this is awesome and in kindergarten uh, I was in the a.m. class which means that it was the morning session there weren't very many kids in my grade at the time so they had a morning session and an afternoon session and only two kindergarten teachers so that's four separate kindergarten classes so we didn't all know each other as we uh, aged and graduated from one grade to the next, eventually the social contact increased. But in kindergarten, it was a pretty, pretty small world. And there was a playground directly outside of the kindergarten classes, right close. And it wasn't very big, but it had a tire swing. I love tire swings. And it wasn't one of those uh, plastic, hard plastic ones, no. One of those old-fashioned uh, rubber ones with chains, metal chains, um, and attached to a wooden support beam. Oh, I love that tire swing. Uh, we had to line up when recess was about to start. We had to line up in front of the door. And so I would look at the clock and I would watch the clock and I'd be like, oh. Oh, it's almost recess. I'm going to be the first in line. I'm going to be the first in line. I'm going to be the first in line. And I would rush to get there. And then when they'd let us outside, once everybody had single file arranged themselves in the line, rush straight for the tire swing. I loved it. And sometimes the other kindergarten class had already been let outside and someone had beat me to the tire swing and it was really depressing. I'm exaggerating. It wasn't depressing. It was just like... What am I going to do today? Just wasn't the same. Because I loved tire swings so much from the time I was in kindergarten, uh, when I was older and in middle school, uh, and uh, we had another tire swing, I remember, again, wanting to beat people to that tire swing in middle school. On a totally different playground, of course. But I'm getting out of myself. <laughs> my favorite times of the day. I mean, I loved school. I loved being there. But I really loved recess. Really loved lunch. Lunch and recess. And uh, when we had music classes. I liked that. I didn't really like it, but I liked it. And when we'd have school plays, I, for some reason, didn't want to be in the play, I didn't want to be like a performer. I didn't want to. Um, I didn't want to act. 
I wanted to be the narrator. For some reason, whichever play it was, I wanted to tell the, a part of the story to the audience. There were usually more than, uh, they usually cast more than one kid to, to be a narrator. There were like three or four narrators. Like we did, uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, I remember one year? I remember being the narrator for that. And because I didn't have, uh, I wasn't a really prominent character or role, I spent a lot of time waiting while other people practiced their lines to, you know, get to go out on stage and, you be quiet over there! So I'd be, <laughs> I'd be behind the furthest back curtains on the stage, just sort of, you know, chilling doing whatever, um, using my imagination. <laughs> Sometimes they'd have to come find me and be like, uh, you've been back here this whole time? Uh, you missed your part. We had to skip you because we didn't know where you were. And I'm like, oops. Sorry. <laughs> oh, going to the library. Mm. Recess, lunch, and going to the library. I think my favorite place to be in the school, you know, when, when you're at recess, it doesn't count, you're outside the school. Favorite place in the school was the library. It's an awesome library because it has, uh, it's right in the center. They might have, you know, changed things since then, but it was right in the center of the school. And there's halls going past it on either side, and the computer lab is at the end of it. And of course, there's the front desk where the librarian is on the other end. And I loved that library. It had a Kiva in one half of it, which is like a little recessed area with um, steps around it that you can sit on. You can use them as, as a seat, a uh, place to sit. And someone could stand in the middle, hold a book, and read it to you. And the there wasn't a wall around this library. The shelves were like half walls. So I was so, you know, small and short that I couldn't see over the shel shelves, you know. When I went to school, I just remember walking past it and going, you know, what's over there? Because I was so tiny. I couldn't see. So when we finally went to the library and I got to walk around in there and look at all the books and uh, books on tape, too. The ones that come, they came in like a plastic baggie with, uh, like a Ziploc baggie with like plastic handles at the top that you could open and close. And it had a cassette tape in it and the book. I love those. Um, just a very auditory person. Just, uh, I, it's probably genetic. I just, I respond really well to, to opportunities to hear things and listen to things. Um, music is very, it has a very profound effect on me. It, it can be very therapeutic for me to listen to music. It, it, it sort of gets my brain to, whereas it was feeling cluttered or chaotic or or distracted or, or fuzzy or inundated with contradictory feelings, that listening to music helps it focus. It helps it sort of synchronize. Um, my mom sang to me a lot when I was growing up. And I was talking to her maybe a month ago, and I said, Mom, thank you so much for singing to me. For singing to me ever since probably before I was born. Thank you so much for doing that, because it, it calmed me down. It, it made me feel loved. And it, it gave my brain uh, something that helped it, I guess, structure itself and build memories and uh, associate emotions with with songs and uh, learn pitch and tone of voice and and rhyme you know the structure to a song uh, I just became really linguistically just good at language it helped me when um, my parents would read a book hearing the words and seeing them on the page. I loved that, oh, these things that you're saying are actually, you know, letters and words on a page. 
had to take a break, but I'm back. Where was I? Okay. So, I'm a really good active listener. And I think part of it's genetic, but of course also, uh, from a very young age, I was just, um, exposed to singing and, and talking and reading stories and, and books and things and, um, if, if that's what set me up for vulnerability to, um, to hear voices, to have auditory hallucinations, then that would make sense. That I just for some reason, the, the the part of my brain that processes sound just I guess was overactive, and and when I crossed the threshold from you know being uh, I guess what you would say mentally stable or, or sane, it crossed the threshold into psychosis, and I started hearing voices. I guess it just the, the sound processing part of my brain just sort of confused what was going on in my mind internally in my thoughts with what I was actually hearing in reality. It just sort of mixed them up uh, and confused them. I really wouldn't be surprised if uh, that's why. Um, visual hallucinations, I actually... Uh, the only thing that I could even remotely guess was a visual hallucination was in the past, I don't know, two, two years or maybe three years, there were some moments when I'd be laying down and looking up at the walls or the ceiling and I'd see what, what I would describe as like um, little fuzz bunnies sort of things, except they looked like they were possibly like spiders, like a really weird fuzzball, fuzzy sort of spider, you know, something with a lot of legs. And it seemed like there were a bunch of them and, and they were moving around the edge of my vision. It looked like they were moving on the wall and in, in the corner where the, the wall meets the ceiling and and at first, of course, this is really freaky because your brain's going, you're really seeing that, that's really there. And you have to stop and go, wait, wait, nothing, nothing I've ever seen moves like that. Nothing I've ever seen looks like that. It, it looks creepily like it's actually there. But wait, you know, wait, calm, calm down. Calm down, what is that? I think it's just something going wrong with the visual part of my brain. <laughs> Some, something's going wrong. And that's the only times, the only times I've ever, I think, had visual hallucinations were, were those times. It hasn't happened to me in a while. Um, but maybe, maybe six or seven times that that happened. So I, I learned to recognize what it was and go, okay, maybe if I just calm myself down, you know, look, look around remind myself it's not really there you know if someone's in the room hey do you see that see what well this and describe it and they don't see it then you know <laughs> there's nothing there <laughs> and, and uh my ex knew to not lie about that kind of stuff you know don't try to trick somebody who's in that state of mind. It's, it's, it's not going to do them any good, and it's just going to ruin the trust between you if you abuse that and you think it's funny. So don't, don't do that. If you're a family member of someone who sees things or hears things, or a friend, or a loved one, don't, don't mess around when they ask you, did you, did you just see that? Did you just hear that? You gotta tell them the truth. Be real, be honest, okay? Don't go abusing their precious trust in you to help them do a reality check. To know that what they think is there isn't actually there. Because it's hard enough. It's hard enough when you're in this state of the fabric of reality getting confused with, you know, whatever your mind is imagining or seeing. It's hard enough dealing with that. It just makes you more paranoid if you don't feel like you can trust somebody to tell you the truth. So, careful with that.
So, uh, school. Yeah. The other thing about, uh, tire swings, I got very good at, um, pushing myself on the tire swing, even if no one else was there who wanted to play on the tire swing with me. Or if I was on the playground by myself waiting to be picked up for some reason, if I had to stay after school instead of taking the bus home, you know, play on the playground and learned how to push myself. How to stand up, hold the chains, and do things with my legs to make the tire swing, you know, go around. I remember doing things with my feet in the sand to, at one point, start a spin. Like, get it going really fast. And then pick my feet up and then do this, you know, punch in or lean out, um, because you can control the motion of the tire swing. So, and in fourth grade, uh, people knew how good I was. Not everybody. My friends, they knew. <laughs> knew how good I was at, um, maneuvering the tire swing, at pushing around and around and around faster until I felt like I had enough momentum that I could grab the chain and on my final, you know, push of building up that energy, spin it. Like just whew, put a wicked spin on it. And then the people sitting, there's usually two people, people sitting on the tire swing, you know, holding the chains and leaning in and just enjoying the centrifugal force. And I can't do that now. <laughs> I tried to do it uh, about a year ago and I just, my stomach can't handle it. I get. I get a little bit uh, queasy. I, I can't. I can't be spun <laughs> as an adult like I could as a kid. I just I can't. My body can't tolerate it. It's sad. But that was a lot of fun. Or uh, playing on the playground in elementary school. There was a metal slide that I would pretend was a waterfall, <laughs> and uh, I take my sweater off because obviously playing on the playground you get really warm and and warm enough that you could take off your sweater, tie it around the bar, and hang on to it, and, 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 and act like an, an imaginative drama of, oh, the canoe went over the edge of the waterfall, and hang on for dear life, somebody help me, somebody grab my arm, don't let me perish, you know? Silly stuff like that. Or be on the swing and pretend that it's like uh, a helicopter or a bomber, and every time you come down, you know? Um, imagine that you were a, a plane or something that was you know, swooping down. Oh yeah, that was fun. And <laughs> there's a family picture where I'm wearing red tights and a dress <laughs> out in the, the front yard of the house we were living in at the time when I was like five. And the look on my face is just priceless. It's like... How much longer do I have to wear these itchy tights before I can go back inside the house and change and go play? Because <laughs> dresses get in the way. They really do. And then if you get them dirty or you rip them, you're just in trouble. You're in, oh, so much trouble. And I'm like, uh, I want to play. I'm a little kid. I want to play, you know? I want to go do the things that my brothers are doing. I want to go do things on the playground that you can't do in a dress. And I don't want to worry about people teasing me about seeing my underwear because they're pervs. <laughs> uh, so, so I was a pants and shirt kind of girl. Only wore a dress when I had to and tended to mope <laughs> until I could take it off. <laughs> Elementary school. Most of that was a positive experience. I remember third grade, they, uh, my homeroom class, the teacher said, okay, we're going to make a, like a newsletter, like a publication, where we talk about uh, things that we're doing in the class, and your parents get to see it, and uh, we're, we're going to come up with a name. So everybody, um, raise your hand, tell us your idea for a name for the newsletter, and then we'll vote, okay? And whichever one most of the kids in the class like, We'll win the vote, and that'll be the name of the newsletter. And guess what? I won the popular vote. <laughs> and uh, my idea for the name of the newsletter, I came up with an alliteration. Two words that started with the same letter. Jackman Jamboree. 
Yep. I felt like I felt like I was on top of the world when everybody voted that. It's the most popular. Okay, so just trying to impart to you that I had normal moments of my childhood, especially especially in elementary school. Um things didn't get really serious until middle school. And that's when things began to get really difficult for me to deal with, to psychologically move through, uh, to separate the confusion in my mind from what was really going on around me. To, to, it's really hard to draw a line and understand uh, what things you really should be afraid of that really could put you in danger and what things uh, are harmless. You know, it, it's so difficult to distinguish when you're anxious what is a valid fear and what is just something that your mind is obsessing about, fixating on, and, and freaking out over. That if you weren't in that anxious state, you wouldn't even be thinking about it. You wouldn't even notice. It's, it's, it's very difficult. Um, it, it took me <laughs> a couple decades to, to realize that that was, that was, um, it was an exaggeration of my mind, of the fear part of my brain. Total exaggeration. It wasn't necessarily um, provoked by emotional things. That's the fascinating thing is that something could be emotionally causing anxiety. Some, an emotional thing could cause you to feel nauseous, you know, sick to your stomach. Uh, but also the other way around. A physical thing could cause you to have an emotional reaction. It's, uh, it's interesting to try to figure out what came first, the chicken or the egg, sort of thing. And eventually I realized, oh, if I hadn't had this biochemical reason to have a buildup of fight or flight hormones, I probably wouldn't have had these emotional reactions to things, you know? If you took out the physical, physiological factor, you fixed it, you prevented that problem from happening, I probably wouldn't have had emotional reasons to be anxious. Uh, or if I did, they wouldn't have been so intense, you know? And I would have been able to resolve them and move on a lot quicker. Um, I didn't get to experience what that's like for your average kid to deal with and move through and, and mature through and, and overcome. It, it's sort of like it, uh, it was a, like an unnecessary roadblock, you know? I had, I had to fight something, a struggle with something that the average kid wasn't dealing with. <laughs> they, they were more concerned with other things, like girls have cooties, <laughs> and does this person like me? And are my shoes cool enough, you know? Uh, and and I hope my parents don't yell at me for getting this bad grade on this test. <laughs> and I, I hope that my friend doesn't get mad at me for something and then cancel our plans to hang out together after school. <laughs> you know? I didn't have that luxury of worrying about those kinds of things because I was so preoccupied. And that's another thing that I meant to say, is that I wish I wasn't so preoccupied with what was going on with me. I wish that that was not center stage to my, to my day. I was so, in a way, self-absorbed into just trying to maintain some stability that I could not pay the right amount of emotional attention to people I cared about. I, I couldn't do it. It it was it took so much out of me just to try to stay stable and figure out what the heck was going on and and to deal with um, emotional hiccups, to deal with stressful emotional conversations or arguments with other kids, misunderstandings or you know hurt feelings. It just, it's, I was so preoccupied with that I could not pay enough attention to my friends to go, you know what, this person over here, I think that they need something from me. I think I should say, hey, are you feeling okay? Hey, do you want to go play outside? You know, 
Uh, hey, did you have fun the other day when we did this? Hey, can I hang out at your house sometime? Hey, you want to have a sleepover at my house? Yeah, you know, I couldn't focus on those things. So when I did go to another, you know, a, a, a person's house for a friend's birthday party or sleepover, even then I couldn't really fully enjoy it because I was so, like, anxious and paranoid and self-contained and, and just trying to not say something dumb, not trying to embarrass myself, not trying to prove to people that I was not like them. I remember being at a, a slumber party, and it was at that age when girls are talking about boys, and they're no longer, oh, boys are gross, but like, oh, this guy's so cute, do you think he likes me? Why do you girls like boys so much? They're, they're, do you not remember how mean they were to us? Do you not remember? In kindergarten, one boy sitting next to me in the Kiva in my kindergarten class, he pinched me. Pinched me right. Pinched me. I was so furious. I was so mad at him. And then, of course, later, not, not very much later, someone explained to me that, oh, Boys are mean to girls to get their attention. It really means that they like you. Okay, I gotta wrap this up because we need to go to the grocery store. But, to finish my thought, at that age, I was still upset. The boys thought that they could go from treating girls like we were the scum of the earth to worshipping the very ground we walk on. I was like, this is so contradictory. This is so inconsistent, you know? You boys are fickle. And uh, I didn't understand that it was hormones. Hormones were doing that because um, I went through puberty a lot slower than I guess other people did. Um, I think that's because of very likely a genetic reason that my body wasn't producing estrogen at the rate that the other girls my age were. Uh, I need to I need to get a genetic test to confirm my suspicions that it's probably the uh, the gene that controls production of the enzyme MTHFR. I know I'm gonna make a mistake if I try to remember what that acronym what what that shorthand is, but it's the enzyme that processes um, converts folic acid and converts food source folate into active form folate. So that's like three different types of vitamin B9. So I think if I didn't have that genetic issue, <laughs> um, if my body was able to convert uh, nutrients in the food I was eating into active form vitamin B9 more efficiently, I probably would have had sufficient levels of estrogen and probably would have been swooning over boys just like the other girls. Uh, but instead, I was in a state of sort of um, apathy. Apathy about it. About people having crushes on each other, thinking other kids were cute, or worrying if they liked them. That kind of thing. I was just like... <laughs> Why are you wasting your time wondering if this person likes you? Don't you remember last week when he said this mean thing to you to impress his friends? Gosh, you girls, you girls are so fickle. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, so I gotta go. I hope you enjoy this video. See ya. Oh, I'm so tired. I had to sit down on the bench in the kitchen catch my breath and my mom said honey are you okay <laughs> and I didn't answer her because I was still catching my breath with my head down like this she said are you okay and I said I'm fine I'm just not a spring chicken anymore that's all <laughs> because my mom's 73 and my dad's 75 I like to joke that I'm as old as they are <laughs> Because I sprinted down to the to the pump house and I sprinted back, but I can't sprint for very long. I run out of energy so fast. But anyway, I don't know if I'll put this at the beginning of my video or at the end. 
But I do want to say that if you remember in part one of my Once Upon a Time I Was a Kid video, I mentioned that I had two friends who were consistently my friends from kindergarten through senior year of public school. And the cool thing is, they both signed my senior yearbook. I'm not going to name names, but I'm going to read what they wrote. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. Cover up the star. Ta -da! My two friends that I met on my first day of kindergarten, one of them, at least one of them, rode the bus with me to school, my, my very first day of school. Uh, I think the other one was possibly sick the first day of kindergarten, so I didn't get to meet her. But I was, I was told about her, because they were both friends, because they lived in the same sub subdivision. They already knew each other. Uh, anyway, so... This is so sweet. You've been such a great friend to me all these years. I will miss you, and I will never forget you. Remember in fifth grade when we played Fido and Fido Dog Detectives? <laughs> I, I'm so sad that I barely, barely remember that. That was so much fun, and we found all that change and donated it to help pay for that guy's book. Those were the days. I'll miss you, and I'll try to keep in touch. Heart ya. Um, there was a boy who, he lost a book, and he was going to have to pay money to replace it. So it was, it was that time of year when the snow was melting. And when kids play outside in the winter here, they tend to lose a lot of stuff. Pocket change, out of the pockets, running around, playing stuff like, you know, flag football, whatever. Or tackle, or snow wrestling. <laughs> so we walked around looking for for pocket change the kids had lost and as the snow melted and the grass was starting to show um, you went hunting for change long enough you, you could find enough <clears throat> which back then was was a lot like five bucks in pocket change that was like a lot of money <laughs> we collected all that so the boy uh, wouldn't have to tell his parents, hey, I lost a book, and we have to write a check to the school to replace it. So, here's here's from the other friend, the one that I met on the bus the first day of the kindergarten and was told about the friend whose entry I just read. Okay. Do you remember in third grade when you were a monster and I was airhead? And again, I've omitted our names. It was an alliteration, though. That was really cool! And then there was fifth grade on the tire swing. See, she remembered! So many memories. We go way back. Now, we're moving on with our lives. I'll probably never have you in any of my classes anymore. Good luck in your life. You can accomplish anything you want to. Love, and her name. <laughs> awesome people. Who even when they don't understand why, you know, they didn't understand why I distanced myself, they never forgot. Never forgot the good stuff. <sighs> Friends are awesome. Woo! So I was hanging out with my parents tonight. Went with them to go to the grocery store. And they're the funniest. Funny. They are the funniest. They were arguing about where my dad should park the car so that I could run the mail into the post office. <sighs> and my mom said, You belabor the silliest things to my dad. And he said, No, I do not. I follow the rules. Classic. Classic. And then, and then we were in the store where the guy at the checkout, I thought he was so cute. But I only made eye contact with him twice. And I only talked directly with him once because he looked familiar to me and I couldn't remember his name and I figured uh oh I probably went to school with this guy and it would be really rude if I can't remember his name <laughs> so I didn't make eye contact with him the rest of the the, the time he was uh, ringing up ringing up the grocery <laughs> and so when we were in the car I told my dad about this 
and uh, I, I asked my mom, so did you think he was cute? Did you think he was cute too? And she said, he was an attractive young man, but he wasn't my type. To which my dad said, she prefers them uglier. <laughs> He was making a self-deprecating joke about himself. They're awesome.